Good afternoon or good morning, depending upon where you are in the country. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Nancy Somerville, CEO of the American Society of Landscape Architects, and I will be hosting today's panel on security design. Recent terrorist attacks, including those in Charlottesville, Barcelona, and London, have brought increased attention to the issues of security in the public realm. How do we balance public safety with our democratic values of open government, free speech, and freedom of assembly? How do we ensure that the civic spaces that we cherish don't come to resemble armed camps in the name of security? As designers of the public realm, landscape architects are at the forefront in addressing these challenges. With us today to help us explore all of the issues involved in security design, we have three leading landscape architects. Our first panelist is Leonard Hopper, FASLA. Len is currently with Weintraub Diaz, an award-winning landscape architecture firm in Nyack, New York. Len is also a faculty member at the City College in New York, where he teaches the Masters in Landscape Architecture Technology Sequence courses. Since 9-11, Len has been very active locally and nationally in the debate around the nature of our security responses. He was a key organizer and participant in the first ASLA convened Security Design Symposium held in New York City in 2002 and chaired the second Security Design Symposium held in Chicago in 2004. Len is a frequent speaker and writer on security design. In fact, he literally wrote the book on that subject. Security and Site Design, a Landscape Architectural Approach to Analysis, Assessment, and Design Implementation, co-authored with Martha Droge, was published by John Wiley and Sons in 2005. Welcome, Len. Our second panelist is Richard Rourke, ASLA. Richard is a partner at Olin in Philadelphia. His work spans a range of scales and typologies, focused on expanding the civic capacity of the landscape. Projects such as the Presidential Sustainability Initiative, Rebuild by Design, Dilworth Park in Philadelphia, and the Los Angeles River Index exemplify a practice focused on sustainable, economical, and well-crafted public design. Richard has done work for the National Planning Commission in Washington, D.C., as well as a number of U.S. embassy and consulate projects abroad, including the New London Embassy in the U.K., Matamoros Consulate in Mexico, and Hyderabad Consulate in India. These projects showcase his understanding of the careful and delicate balance between public realm and security planning. Most recently, Richard has completed a strategic plan for the Eastern Market of Detroit, an economic development plan linking open space and urban design to social equity. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Richard. Our third panelist is Bernie Alonzo, ASLA bringing over 20 years of experience managing large consultant teams and complex processes, Bernie leads Gustafson Guthrie Nichols' most technically challenging projects from that firm's Seattle office. His skill set encompasses all aspects of sustainable project planning and design, including site selection, programming, the development of initial concepts and deliverables, budgeting, and the execution of documentation and construction administration. Due to Bernie's regional expertise in stormwater management, he has been appointed to the Edison Sub-Area Clean Water District Advisory Board in Skagit County, Washington, to combat near-range and long-term challenges caused by sea level rise. Bernie has served as the Seattle Design Commissioner and liaison to the Public Art Advisory Committee. He has been a frequent presenter at ASLA conferences and was a lecturer for several years for the Low Impact Development Green Stormwater Infrastructure course at the University of Washington. Like his colleagues on the panel, Bernie and GGM are very familiar with the challenges of security design in the public realm. Gustafson Guthrie Nickel is also the 2017 recipient of the Landscape Architecture Firm Award. Congratulations, Bernie, and welcome. Well, thank you. So to get us started, um, I'm going to start with you, Len, and then ask each of you to respond to this. But how does the issue of security factor into the work that you do? And how are you and your clients considering the evolution of threats to public safety within public spaces? Len. Well, you know, Nancy, it's very project. Uh, some clients are more 
some clients are less concerned. But one thing we take from here, and maybe it's a more personal view, I can't look at any project without considering the security, site design of the security, and the safety of the public. So when we approach a project, we start to look at, you know, what are the possible threats? Uh, we always look at circulation, whether it's pedestrian or vehicular, and look at protecting the public, particularly in those spaces where public, uh, public tends to gather in large groups and see whether uh, they're protected or not. And that could be permanent security design, or when we look at temporary street fairs or areas where it sometimes uh, can change, how can we develop security that uh, can be temporary or modified in nature uh, as the need requires? Richard, how about you? Oh boy. Uh, well, I mean, our, our job, you know, is to, you know, build a, a future where, you know, we're healthy and happy and connected to each other. But there's, there's a flip side uh, to it is uh, thinking about, you know, how, people come together, how they con congregate, um, and recognizing that, you know, some some people, some groups, uh, you want, want to do harm. And there's this incredible balance um, between thinking about uh, who we need to be as a society in space and what makes us a better uh, public realm and a, and a better society by getting to know each other. Um, and then the, the other side is the, that equation of, of risk. So we're constantly kind of thinking about, you know, risk and vulnerability, whether that's security or whether that's climate change. It's, it's kind of this kind of, you know, two sides to, to a coin about making uh, people healthy and, and happy uh, in the culture that, you know, we're designing for them. Bernie. Well, I think similar to uh, our other panelists, GGN approaches our projects uh, to a degree with um, through the lens of security that the client is bringing to the table, and that's that's often very prescriptive in the case of uh, the embassy work or even the Gates Foundation. And then there are other much more open institutions like the University of Washington uh, or generally colleges where the the ideal is to foster the free exchange in open space. So we're the ones who have to really look at um, the security issues and be, be proactive about that. Um, and, and so it's, I think, evolving. I, I think about some of the recent uh, recently completed University of Washington projects where we are seeing exactly what we'd hoped. Huge crowds of people yeah. intermingling, very active gathering um, spaces and it's fulfilling that ideal, but I think about it through the lens of, of new, newer to the U.S. anyway types of attacks, uh, and it's it's not necessarily as as um, security focused as as we might want it to be at this moment in time. And I think that's another aspect uh, with regard to the risk. I think as we design for security and design for risk. Um, it's difficult to start unraveling deeply embedded security features uh, after the fact. So looking at the long range potential of, of risk and, and how that'll play out in our, in our public discourse. I think that's a super conundrum just to, to jump in because uh, a lot of our, our work has been to prevent, you know, physical threats or, you know, it's kind of like when, when there is a, a terrorist attack, it's, you know, uh, you know, it, happening with airplanes, then we're all looking at the airplanes, but we're not looking somewhere else. And if it's, you know, a bomb, we're not thinking about, uh, we're thinking about a car bomb, we're not thinking about a backpacker. Um, so it, ter you know, terrorism and threats like that are so organic. And it's, it's interesting where we are today in terms of thinking about what we can do right away versus the, the longer term uh, strategy about how do we make a more cohesive society. I remember back after you know 9/11 and for you know years after that and and it started before that with the Oklahoma City bombing that a lot of the a lot if not all of the focus certainly a lot was on 
protecting the buildings. And by protecting the buildings, you are also protecting the people who would be inhabiting it. But as you know, as you all know that, and as you were just saying, you know, Richard, the con the that conversation is evolving because the way the terrorists are attacking has been evolving, and we're now at the moment, you know, in the era of the soft target. So while you look at, you know, what a goal of a lot of, you know, of landscape architecture in our public realm is, is to bring people together. So we look at projects as being the most successful that are the most full um, and loved by and used by people. And now we're in a situation where, um, you know, terrorists are, you know, kind of defaulting to vehicles um, because it's easy, they're, they're ubiquitous, um, easy, you know, obviously easy to get, um, doesn't involve having to put together materials for a bomb or, you know, something more sophisticated. So it's, you know, it's every man's terrorist weapon. Um, and, you know, we've seen so many instances of that lately. So how, you know, how is that changing the approach? And, and I'll throw in there too, there has been a little discussion around, um, does that mean that certain areas should be at least at sometimes off limit to vehicles? I mean, what are, what are you all, what are landscape architects, what are you and your projects current and future um, thinking about in those terms? You know, I'd just like to follow up a little bit with what I was saying before. Uh, one of the things that happened when we were looking at security after 9-11, it was very easy to convince the client or it was on the client's mind that they needed to have some sort of security response. As years go by, and there's not as much of uh, emphasis on security, the public becomes very complacent. So I think what we're seeing now is, is uh, another uh, awareness of a different kind of threat. But, you know, again, Nancy, I think whether it's an individual in a car or a coordinated effort, it still comes down to circulation. And as landscape architects, the one thing we can do is we can control, we can restrict vehicular, ac uh, vehicular access as well as pedestrian access. So in many ways, even though the threat has slightly evolved to maybe that individual or the lone wolf that easily takes a car and then uh, you know, uses that to harm people, that restriction on vehicular access and the tools we can use to make that happen are very much the same. I think where we're falling down a little bit is in areas or streets that are only sometimes open to public gatherings. And is there a way that we can easily implement temporary measures for that day, for that weekend, for that summer that will protect the public in those areas and then can be opened up to regular traffic perhaps during other times of the year. That's where I think uh, you know, my current emphasis would be to protect those people in those informal gatherings that are somewhat temporary in nature in those spaces. I, I, I to jump in, jump in on that. Uh, how I, I think just like the the terrorism threats are organic. I think the way that we make ourselves resilient uh, should be organic and evolving. And I, I think we spend a lot of time. Um, and we need to bring this up to our clients and have a very healthy and frank conversation about how, what's the cost benefit to, you know, the, the security move, you know, what, what are the, the long-term health outcomes? I'll tell you, one of the biggest ironies today for me, if you think about, you know, the urbanism of cities is the, the turning radius. It, it we, we have, you know, broader and broader and broader turning radiuses that we, you know, account for that are based off of the fire truck and its dimension and its ability to be a, a first responder quickly from point A to point B. But ironically, the bigger you make that turning radius, the greater uh, risk you create in terms of the exposing a pedestrian to in, in the crosswalk area. and. So we we really have to think about the implications of these design moves and the, this investment that becomes transformative in our infrastructure across the board and in, in our design standards because the the impacts may protect us in one place and and harm us in another. 
Bernie, do you want to jump in on that conversation? Sure. Actually, I think it's interesting, Richard, that you bring up the turning radius piece because in Seattle, um, and this isn't a security move, it's a pedestrian safety, which is a tremendous, we're, we're in the process of trying to get to uh, zero total pedestrian uh, injuries uh, and deaths. I think the target date is 2025. And part of that, our, our transportation department has actually taken a hard look at all of the intersections and is allowing for new standards such that we're actually um, reducing the, the corner radii so on many intersections so that we actually shorten the crosswalk distances. We're facilitating uh, more pedestrian priority and we're um, reducing vehicle speeds. And, and they're now allowing uh, for the first time ever for the movement to actually do what it does in the real world, and that's use some of the adjacent lanes as they're making the turns, but you're you're creating a greater and more safe environment for a larger number of people than the, uh, not to set these things in a, in a false, um, uh, false equivalency or false uh, comparison, but the security of um, organic threats is, something that is going to continue to be much harder to control and to um, to address through peer design moves, uh, whereas we can make people safer every day in their day-to-day -day lives through through good urban design. Yeah, another great point. Let me follow up on uh, something that Len raised, talking about um, appropriate use of temporary security versus pieces that are permanent. Um, certainly one of the conversations we've had over the years is, is the um, issue of um, the just ever so lovely Jersey barrier that um, <laughs> was, you know, seemed cheap and easy and was put out, you know, for temporary security. And then years later, you still have that ever so lovely um, piece of public sculpture, you know, dominating your landscape. Um, so that's obviously not the only temporary option that's out there, but but let's talk a little more about about temporary and permanent and how you make those calls and uh, how you do them ele elegantly or eloquently. That was a that was a, a major issue. Uh, you know, Jersey barriers were surrounding the Washington uh, Monument for uh, quite a, a while and. Um, just to bring up on uh, the screen for a moment, I can share with you uh, the design that, that we came up with, but essentially a, um, a, a truck uh, was a threat, uh, a freight truck was a threat to um, uh, taking down the, the Washington Monument that we all know today. Um, and so for the first solution was the Jersey barrier. and. Um, uh, Lori Olin, uh, you know, came up with a, a design that actually borrowed from you know the historic uh, landscape concept of the um, the ha ha, uh, because this idea of reconciling security, which I think it is, it is our job to think about what can we reasonably do to protect, you know, um, uh, our people and our you know icons, but it ha it can't come at the displacement of the culture of our civic realm. And I think the Washington Monument is a great example of the, the challenge of, you know, finding the right thing that actually through this low wall that surrounds the monument is a vehicular barrier, but it is also something that puts the monument on a pedestal. And those are the careful rationalizations uh, in design that, that we, have, we have to do um, to get it right. Richard, I'm glad you brought that one up because um, that's one of my favorites. It's uh, I use that as a poster child for good security design and the uh, the brilliance of that as it is in other projects that are, you know have, that have really showcased good security design is visitors have no idea in the world that that very elegant walk up is actually a security feature, which is kind of the ideal situation. So there's you know enjoyment of the landscape. And the monument, and and no idea that that there's a security feature that's present as part of it. 
that's what we hope to accomplish. Well, and I'll, sh I'll share an image here. Um, so I think working off of some of the same ideas that uh, uh, that Richard and Lori had for the uh, for the Washington Monument, the uh, African American History Museum, uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, actually, um, it, we we employed similar techniques where the low walls along the street side are held back, making for a comfortable pedestrian experience and realm. But the walls are there to do that vehicle security job. The um, sad fact of how how malicious and organic uh, terrorism uh, attempt can be to frighten people. A as far as I know, no one's attempted a direct frontal assault on this site, but people have left nooses on the on the grounds here. It's it's mm -hmm. such a fraught period of time in our history um, between uh, forces that see each other as opposed to each other. And, and um, I think we can do a lot um, to design um, to design in a way that can help prevent major attacks and high casualty incidences. But I think by having these public spaces where we can continue uh, to have great public dialogue and discourse and expression of ideas, it, it, only through that are we going to get to to uh, beyond these these uh, at least internal tensions there. It, within the US. Mm -hmm. So Len, I'm going to circle back to you. Um, since you brought up the issue of temporary and permanent um, and ask you to expound on that a little bit and and maybe um, also you and the others talk a little bit more about uh, we've seen a couple two really great examples. You know, what are the other tools in your toolkit when you're looking to secure a space? So I will tell you in New York, uh, we've been able to evolve in terms of temporary measures past the Jersey barrier to now the garbage truck. So now what we have is blocking <laughs> infrastructures to provide temporary description of vehicular activity. And the first thing that comes to my mind for municipalities is why not buy some sort of vehicle that could actually enhance the experience of the event, uh, could be manned by people if it's a cultural parade or whatever it might be, and make that part of the event as a part of, as opposed to something that's really not meant for that purpose. So I would give before maybe sharing a couple images as well, would be what happens at uh, Madison Square Garden. They have some removable bollards on the corner they very easily come out when they need to uh, bring in tractor trailers or concerts or whatever the event might be, and very easily go back. So I think we're at a point where people are supplying uh, concrete barriers that look better than the standard uh, Jersey barrier, and bollards that could easily be put in place for a day, for a weekend, uh, and be removed again to allow traffic to flow through unrestricted. I will show you, hopefully be able to get to a couple uh, slides here if I could share my screen. Am I sharing my screen with you? Yes, we got it, yes. Okay, so in terms of tools that might be in your toolkit, you know, the entry uh, here restricts access of vehicles in terms of width as well as uh, height. And one of the things I think we need to touch on when we look at different tools and different uh, techniques and strategies is how can we relate it to the history or the culture of the site. Mm -hmm. This happened to be an abandoned shipyard. Uh, we tried to arrange benches along the esplanade in a way that separated areas where vehicles might go, even if they're emergency or maintenance vehicles from pedestrian areas. Uh, we tried to create areas that control vehicular and pedestrian circulation by using some of the artifacts from the abandoned shipyards. So it became sort of educational as well as, you know, pretty formidable barriers to anybody that are uh, looking to invade one of these spaces. 
elements that restrict access yet at the same time provide amenities for the users of the park or the esplanade. Another way of taking these common elements and forming barriers to uh, restrict and control access. And then of course, what we do best as landscape architects using topography, using boulders, using some aspect of the site that creates a physical barrier, but yet at the same time, an aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing event, as well as raising the area of certain congregation areas and sitting areas. So that uh, again, a long line of different sorts of bollards that we can separate vehicles from pedestrians. So as landscape architects, we, we have the techniques we have the tools in our toolkit with amenities, and we have the ability to creatively and innovately, innovatively put those into a space in a way that secures the public safety without them even knowing. What I love and what's obviously common about all of the examples that the three of you have shown is how seamless that security is, that it, it's, you're just looking at beautiful settings. There's not an awareness of anybody who's going to be using it or entering it that they're being protected. I mean, and I think that's the the goal um, that we would hope to have happen with all projects, which um, which doesn't always happen. And um, that brings me to um, a word that's already mentioned: the B word, bollard. Uh, Len, you mentioned some cases where um, they're using retractable or you know bollards that you can. Uh, put out when you have an issue. Um, it's certainly, they can certainly be way more attractive than Jersey barriers or lend your trash trucks. Um, but I think we'd all agree that none of us would really like to see the bollardization of all of our communities either. Uh, and that one of the things that we noticed post 9-11, particularly, you know, in DC where I am, um, where you have a you know something that they believe will work um, for what they thought the threat was at the time, which was a bollard, and then a, a a design of one which is a little bit better or more acceptable gets used in front of one building, and before you know it, you have just acres of a bollard. Um, and I think Capitol Hill is unfortunately an example of that, where you know a bollard that had been created for places around the White House and around the, the um, old executive office and the new executive office building um, kind of got blessed as used and now we have acres of it around the Capitol, which does not really look beautiful, I have to say. So what's what is the what's the place of the bollard and and what are the ways we can avoid it? You know, Nancy, I tried to share a screen with you now of the uh National Museum of the American Indian. We have and, it. You know, bollards are great because they're going to allow accessibility for pedestrians as well as people that might be in wheelchairs or walkers. But here you're looking at a case where very importantly, the bollard is integrated into other site features such as the rocks that are representative of the different tribes that are celebrated within the building itself. And to left and right, you would have raised planters, which again, do not allow a vehicle to get into the congregating space in front of the, uh, in front of the building. So I think what we mostly object to is when you have 150, 200 followers lined up in a row, uh, and that becomes the only level of security. If we can find a way of integrating it into the site, so that's a small part of the security measure, great for allowing uh, pedestrian traffic in and out, but it's not the sole means of security. I think that's what we uh, sort of want to try to strive for. Yeah, Richard or Bernie, what can you add to that? I, I think that, you know, the, the, the bollards, the, you're, it is a case of too much of a, a good thing. I've, I've seen lots of bollards, you know, you, uh, in different places in the world where you're like, that's a good thing. I like looking at it, um, but, um, uh, you know, and they've always been around for traffic guidance, and they, they've played a, a a good role. And then, you know, in the context of defense, it becomes about the perimeter and establishing that. And you like try bollards for a while, and you're like, I can't do another bollard; it's it's hurting me. 
and then and then you go to the planter and then you know the the planter is, is this odd thing where it has a jersey bear inside it and then it has this you know like four inches of you know soil in it and yep. you you get some hair just hanging out out the side of it and you know and then you you know the, the boulders are always good they're a friend but yeah it 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 it, it boils down to me is is the the cost benefit and the proportionality of it you know there's some facilities that we that are cultural icons or that has such essential functions that that's probably the only way you know we we can go and it's been the ongoing piece of uh, consulate and embassy design but it, you know it, it it also makes you fret a lot you know doing doing work for um, the, the state department those people who work in the diplomatic mission are amazing people trying to create relationships um, in the in the countries that they're they're operating in and do such you know valuable work representing uh, the United States and we have to create these fortified you know containers and it's a constant you know internal battle between um, you know challenging our skills to create the most diplomatic appearance to our embassy and consulate facilities while at the same time recognizing that there are a lot of places in the world where they're doing these very brave things but operating um, under severe threat and so I think the threat having really credible threat assessments whether it's inside the United States or outside the United States in terms of the cost benefit analysis of it all is something that really needs to come into a higher state of play. Bernie, do you care to weigh in on this debate? Uh, I'll offer that I think like Richard, um, I think we do get tired of our bollards and then we start to look to alternatives and, and sometimes you're presented with things that are even worse that meet that security requirement. So the operable bollard, while I might not like it, is certainly more aesthetically pleasing than the normally deployed up wedge barrier uh, or some other really obtrusive piece of security equipment. I think bollards um, in some cases are the right solution and to a degree, and I'm not arguing that the, that we would prefer that they're ubiquitous, they are so ubiquitous, people tend not to notice them. I think um, as designers, we can see them uh, knowing the problems that they're addressing, we can fixate on them, but I think for the broadest population, they just sort of disappear into the background. So while we're, we're talking about the bollard, uh, I know one of the, the conversations that has happened over the years, especially after 9-11, uh, as Lynn mentioned, uh, there was that heightened sense of security design and a lot more focus on it. That has that dropped off. I think now we're for a very good reason, it's coming back up. But one of the conversations that we had back then was around um, a little bit of a dearth of product and uh, you know innovation and ingenuity and development of uh, you know of the technical ways to do it and the products um, that you all could use. Um, and that, of course, the the topographic approaches and things don't require that um, the same way as as a newer, better, or less obtrusive bollard or gate or you know, things along those lines. What what do you all think about the the state of, you know, what you're able to draw on in terms of, you know, hardscape and, you know, those hardened features as part of your design? Do you get them created? I mean, do you, do you design things um, anew? Um, are you, you know, just designing new things or are there kind of off the shelf available um, alternatives that are kind of aesthetically acceptable and useful in design now? I think the big difference from immediately following 9-11 was that people were not focused upon this in on uh, product development. So what we started to see after then were people developing products that actually went through a uh, a crash level rating system so that we as landscape architects, if we were going to specify a certain item, we would actually be able to get a crash rating on the item that uh, we're, we would be specking and installing as opposed to custom, de de uh, custom designing everything 
and then having an engineer do some calculations to be able to see if it would withstand the required uh, barrier. I think the other thing that we touched on earlier was that velocity of control, uh, control of velocity of a vehicle opens a wider range of elements that we could use to restrict that vehicle. So a slower moving vehicle can actually be restricted with a wider range of options than, than, than just the most stringent bollard or barrier. So I think the difference we're seeing now is that there's more products available to be able to design something that's restrictive with some level of confidence uh, that you're assuring the public safety. That's a great co comment. You know that that's kind of a super subtle. Is, is is the question is is that the the more that you have a clear approach that you can get a vehicle up to speed is you know a, a greater risk because you know it's it's mass times acceleration. You know is the is the force. Um, so slowing down. You know having a, an urban environment where vehicular uh, travel is limited. Um, in terms of how much speed uh, you can get up is, a, is another way of thinking about the problem versus always thinking about the endpoint barrier. Bernie, do you have an addition to that conversation? Well, I think we've also, um, I think it's important, uh, Leonard mentioned uh, rated systems and rated bollards, and I think there are always going to be those circumstances where your client security threats warrant a full rating of the full site. And so you have to be looking at those um, those numbers. They're gonna need to have been certified uh, or you're going to need to do a lot of heavy engineering to get, to get it right and to be confident in the solution. But I think Richard made a point earlier and that is looking at the relatively relative risk and the relative cost benefit. And we're seeing situations where we're able to adapt um, things that we commonly work with, and, and I'll cite the Gabion basket. The Gabion wire basket, when filled with, with rock, while it's not, if it were just plopped into place on a piece of sidewalk, it's not going to provide you that rated, a rateable um, security level. But if you consider it in conjunction with a full site solution where that might be a retaining wall that goes up three to four feet and that's still a comfortable pedestrian height to be next to but you're able to um, then fill behind that with with a landscape so back to our grading solutions well well that's not a rated system it passes the um, passes the test of that risk benefit uh, trade-off I mean it's amazing when you can spend you know, with certain footings, you know, on these bollards, you can spend $8,000 on one bollard and you're like, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Where, where did the site budget go? It went, it went, it went to those 32 bollards. That's yeah. it, that's all you get. And along those same lines, um, I, it seems to have improved a little, although it, it may not stay that way, but uh, one of the things that we certainly saw in DC post 9-11 was as, you know, the bollards or hardened street furniture or, you know, faux planters that couldn't grow anything, you know, kind of things you all have described, um, you know, came out around, you know, one federal building after another. And what we started to have a situation that we referred to as security envy, where the agency, you know, or the art museum that didn't have it, you know, suddenly wanted it, felt like, you know, they were a target or gee, aren't we as important? Or, you know, or couldn't we be threatened as much as the, the agency next door? Uh, and, you know, and it, it just kind of started to roll out. And again, that comes, I think, back to your discussion around what's what's practical, what's real, and really taking a look at, at uh, threat assessment and return on investment for, um, you know, what you're gonna be putting in place. Yeah, I, I think these con security concerns are confounding, you know, because we're confronted with these ethical dile dilemmas between measures we can take to prevent harm at the expense of access and civil liberty and, and, and privacy. I mean, we haven't even gotten to, you know, the conversation about, you know, how many cameras and where can we stick them and what light levels do we need to, to maintain everywhere. And, and it, 
and that's that's a that's a chunk of of money that's dealing with the the known risks that that we have, you know. But we we need to start spending the money on making us less vulnerable. And public, you know, space actually does make us less uh, vulnerable because it allows us as a society to meet each other, to know each other. And it's not only about feeling good, but knowing your neighbors, you know, creates an opportunity, a platform for thinking about uh, mutual aid and, and, and helping uh, one, one another. And I, I think about, you know, the campaigns that have been had from, you know, making sure that people know CPR and first aid and, you know, having a sense of knowing their, their neighborhood, knowing your zone, you know, in New York, you know, when you're thinking about the hurricane or if you see something, say something. I mean, those investments in society and creating a public realm where we can know each other, see each other, experience uh, the world publicly is actually making us safer because we're checking up on each other. And when a crisis happens organically, the, the first responders might actually be, you know, the people there. And that cost benefit, nobody's thinking about those numbers. Where I, I do worry so much that we're putting, you know, burglar bars around the public realm. You know, when we think about cost benefit, I think what we're all doing better now is we're thinking about how can we create security with a variety of different amenities that are multifunctional? So you're not only enhance, enhancing the experience or enhancing the space, but you're also increasing security. So it's not just, it's X number of dollars for security, it's divided out over all the other functions that that amenity or element might be providing. Richard, what you just described sounds to me almost like a, a social septed uh, that we we take that idea of of those who are around those eyes that are on it and not only are they there they're um, uh, skilled or or thoughtful about the risks and the the um, dangers that that may be present in in any space and that doesn't have to devolve into paranoia it can just be neighbors helping neighbors with with regards to these threats absolutely i i think that that's 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 a, a direction that we we really need to be investing in because i mean security is just not you know the the terrorism that, that we're thinking of is is not just you know the other people that we don't know who have something against us um you know as a, as a society you know now in america you know our schools are all locked down and we don't have enough budget for playgrounds but we have you know a lot of budget in lockdown procedures and uh some of it you know is, is very well understood how we how we got there but i'm really concerned about the long-term health outcomes of you know kids growing up without physical education and and the socialization of you know growing up in open spaces and exploring space and not, you know, really having that opportunity, you know, in society to feel like they can grow up and navigate it. Instead, we are at a point where we are super controlled in the interests of, you know, that lightning strike event that um, has traumatized us. And we, we, we have to make investments in and physical security and in protocols. And I'm not saying don't do that, but our pendulum needs to, to come back and rethink this and think it, about it strategically in terms of how do we empower people to make us collectively more safer. That seems to, as you said, kind of come back to some of the, the you know early principles of, of SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design and, the, and your social SEPTED and and Jane Jacobs' eyes on the street and how we, you know, all our community. And Brian uh, Park was all about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And the that certainly is is what I think most of us. And I'm not a love you all, but I'm not a landscape architect. I'm not a designer, but I, I have a passion about 
the public places, the, the civic realm, the public realm, the community spaces that we share and how darned important that is to our identity and our ability to have that that socialization, that to feel part of a community and and not isolated. And you know, so when you it, you know that uh, you're absolutely right. The investment in that um, is is a really critical piece, um, and and we don't want that to start looking like you know the armed camp, which is you know something that could be instilling fear instead of being you know a welcoming shared space, um, which makes the challenge of, for you all as the designers even greater, doesn't it? It does. It provides us more opportunities for solutions. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. We just need to get more money into the government budgets to help you to help you do that. A little, a little more understanding of that kind of critical component. Um, a couple other questions before we run out of time. I want to get back to, um, and one um, picking up on um, Richard. I think you were the one who mentioned the you know the, the more and more ubiquitous security cameras. So um, are those a help, a hindrance, or do they not? really factor at all into, um, you know, kind of making spaces more secure from your point of view? I, you know, in, in terms of, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of opportunity and good that, that comes out of, you know, uh, monitoring uh, public, public space. Uh, it, it even helps in looking at post occupancy evaluations in terms of how spaces are, are best used for the, for the public interest. Um, but there's also this, um, you know, switch that uh, in terms of we now have such a, a huge monitoring uh, infrastructure that you really can't have somebody, you know, seeing everything that's going on, even though you have cameras that are literally seeing everything that, that that's going on. So a lot of that work of the security camera winds up being after the fact, you know, deconstructing uh, what happened and in, in identifying individuals that, you know, weren't uh, tracked. Um, and, you know, it, they, they, do have, they, they do have their, their positives, but we're, we're also, you know, in a society now that we're, there's no privacy in the public realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the other issues that I think um, some people raised after, particularly after Charlottesville, um, City Lab um, ran an article that suggested, you know, based on what happened there, um, and not the vehicular attack as much as the rallies and the people who were gathering there, and the armed militias that were gathering there. And City Lab took the position that that open carry. And the way it was being used there really constituted essentially an assault on our public space. Um, obviously, putting you know the fear uh, pretty darn present right there. Um, if you weren't a member of that militia, it sure wouldn't feel so great um, to have that there. Um, that's that seems a little new. Um, have have you all in your prac in the work that you've done um, talked about that issue? Um, would you have recommendations for public policy um, for the future, for where we go as far as that's concerned? Well, I, I wouldn't want to necessarily punt on this, but those are tricky, tough legal questions that were brought up in that, that specific article uh, where it's a clear clash between the First and Second Amendments. Uh, and I don't think that that's hit the right court at the right time to be properly adjudicated. I think this is a, a revival of issues that I think we've faced in the past and our weapons have new lethality. So the way that question gets answered may be different. Um, I, I also, in our practice and in the regions we've been in, while open carry may be allowed in the state, it hasn't factored into uh, any of the gatherings at, at any of our project sites. My personal, yeah, my personal opinion is that uh, open carry weapons in a public open space is not appropriate. And even though it might be the law in that state or that municipality, just like in New York where you can't drink alcohol in the park, well, in some public 
clauses in some public congregation places, you shouldn't be allowed to carry it, uh, a weapon openly, even if uh, the law of your state and municipality would allow you to do it. It does become a lack of intimidation. And in war gatherings like the ones you're mentioning, intimidate the other group and take away from the message that both groups are trying to convey. Yeah, I, and I think the way that Bernie framed it is 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 right that it is very complex between the uh, the first and the and the second amendment. I I think that the open carry laws are soliciting you know danger and and are you know actually openly putting us at risk um, you know in in the provocations. Uh, and that, you know, that traditionally this has not been, you know, gun ownership is a, a, a privilege uh, as much as it is a Second Amendment right. You, you have to use that right um, with with awareness. Um, so, so, and I think that the same for the, the, the hate speech debate is, is when is this becoming um, overtly harmful? Um, and there, and there will innovate new ways to, you know, create symbolism. Um, you know, it, you know, it may be military uniforms today. Before it was sheets and burning crosses. Uh, they will take new forms, and we probably can't deal with every version of that. And you know, I, some, it, we we have to kind of be like. The, I think uh, almost an HBLU attitude to a certain degree of what you know is tolerated in the public realm. Okay, I have one last question for you. So I'm gonna ask you all to address and then after that, um, we'll be at the end of our time. So after that, I want, want to give each of you a, a moment to uh, bring up any points you may not have had a chance to make or to emphasize one that you already made by way of a closing comment. So you can be thinking about that, but not too hard, because first you have to answer my, my last question, which uh, I want to go back to something we touched on a little earlier and really didn't um, drill down on, which is, um, should we be looking more at, uh, at restricting vehicle access to certain kinds of spaces, whether it's, it's streets, markets, um, you know, either all the time or, or some of the time? Is that something we ought to be doing more of? You know, I can start off in New York City, even though we're in a dense urban environment and traffic is always an issue, uh, particularly during the summer, we have street closures all the time. They're for street bears, they uh, close Times Square off the traffic, uh, different uh, avenues to the parks are, are closed to traffic. So the idea of restricting traffic for positive public use is nothing new in New York. I think what we're doing though is we're sort of closing the street without thinking about the safety of the people within those areas when those streets are closed. And that's a point I sort of brought up at the beginning that if we're gonna have these temporary closures there and large people will gather as part of a cultural parade or celebration, we need to find a way of uh, applying temporary measures that are attractive, that are inviting, that are innovative, that are distinctive, that will protect people within that space, and then are just removable and restore that area to full traffic flow afterwards. So should we put a couple? Yes, for positive public purposes, we do it here, it's great, but we need to make no in those times. Okay, Richard, how about you? I, I think we need to look at it in terms of uh, cars are, are, are a means uh, to, to an end. They're, they're, uh, they're beautiful uh, machines that are also kind of ecologically, you know, black holes at the same time. But, but, but we, should, we should look at uh, pedestrianism, you know, first, you know, the, the ability to move about uh, and to socially interact with that, that's an ideal state. And so the, the question should, I think, just be about our cars limiting our ability to be pedestrians and where they are, they need to be restricted. 
Okay, Bernie. I think uh, both Leonard and Richard really uh, made good points on that. I, I do think that uh, clearly the security has to be considered when some roads are closed. I do um, always approach the work from the perspective of a pedestrian. Um, and so I, I, I think that that's the right approach is to, I'm sorry, I'm hearing a lot of feedback. Um, but to, to close the point, I think it's just important to uh, focus on the pedestrian and pedestrian safety and whether the street's closed or the street's open. Um, we need to uh, prioritize safety. Okay, so I think we're just about at the end of our hour. So I want to go back and, and get a last thought or a reemphasis from each of you. Um, Bernie, you, I'll, I'll let you lead off for this one. Sure, I, I'll bring it back to actually the point of the cameras uh, to illustrate a story. And, and that is that we as landscape architects do have an important role to play in total security design for a site or a project whether the project's primarily a building, a site, uh, and I've worked on projects where the owner's team basically felt like the security was something that was segmented off into the security designer's realm, and they didn't involve the landscape architects deliberately. In doing so, we got through construction, they turned on the cameras, and the first thing they said is, how come our cameras can't see anything? And it's because they didn't keep us in the loop enough to know where the trees would work well and wouldn't. So we, we needed to make some adjustments. But in subsequent projects with the client, the uh, collaboration has been um, tightly integrated. That's, that's a really great point. Len, what is your closing thought for us? Well, you know, I've always thought and I continue to think that if we're serious about the war on terror or the war on crime, just like any war, we need to find the battlefield in a way that provides for public safety and at the same time makes it systematic with layers of obstacles in the way of people that intend to do us harm. As landscape architects, we have the experience and the tools in our hand to tilt the balance of that wall. And it's within our purview, and it's really our responsibility to help make that happen. Thank you. And Richard, you you get to have the last word. So a lot of focus has been given to the, the end point of a terrorist uh, event, and how, how do we prevent that through physical Structures, but I think we need to look at it. That's kind of like operating on a damaged heart, uh, and not looking at the whole uh, disease of heart, heart disease. Um, we we need to think about what we can do to uh, one make our society more resilient, and you know what that means in terms of investing in people and the functionality and sociability of the public realm to build a, a stronger, more resilient society. We need to look at, uh, you know, globally, as well as within our own country, the disaffected and, and understand, you know, the, the things that impact culture uh, in ways that create uh, these militarized elements of society. And what can we do in terms of helping to look at resources, equity, fairness, and connectivity to one another uh, that in the you know, end of the day is gonna reduce you know, our exposure to terrorism because simply people know each other as a society. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a lot to ask for, but that's really the only thing that I think is gonna hold us together. Um, and I wanna say that you know, a great example of you know, society functioning organically and responding to, to harm is the, the Cajun Navy in Houston. You know, all those people getting in their boats, finding their boat and saying, I can go out there and I can do something and I can help. That's what we need to be thinking of. 
Those are great last words. Thank you. So Richard, Len, and Bernie, uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, uh, your wisdom, and your uh, your hopes for where we take security design in the future. Uh, this is an important conversation and one we want to continue to keep going. So thank you again. And uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in or will be listening to this later. Um, let's keep the conversation going.